There is endless media coverage about how to become rich uh, and how to stay rich. But what if these stories that we hear are actually misleading us? That's the topic of conversation in today's podcast episode with Seth Stevens Davidowitz, who has a PhD in economics from Harvard, who works as a data scientist and has studied the counterintuitive things that data shows us about wealth, which we would not glean simply from news stories alone. Welcome to the Afford Anything podcast. This is a show that understands you can afford anything, but not everything. Every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else. And that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to any limited resource you need to manage, your time, your focus, your energy. So what matters most? And how do you make decisions accordingly? Answering both of those questions is a lifetime practice, and that's what this podcast is here to explore. My name is Paula Pant. I am the host of the show, and again, New York Times bestselling author and uh, PhD economist Seth Stevens Davidowitz is here to discuss with us what we can learn from data that we can apply to our lives that we would not, and we, this is information that we would not necessarily know based on what is commonly or popularly understood by the stories that we hear. So here he is. Enjoy. Hi, Seth. Hi, Paula. Seth, who is secretly rich in America? Uh, beverage distributors and auto dealership owners. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not the answer I was expecting. Why middlemen? Why beverage distributors? Why auto dealership owners? Why not the people that we more often think of? Celebrities, athletes, um, people who had financial services firms? Well, some of those people obviously are rich as well. But uh, when I was researching this book, I came across a paper. It was in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, capitalists in the 21st century, and they studied the entire universe of taxpayers in the United States. Mm -hmm. And they studied, said kind of who's the typical member of the top 0.1% kind of people earning $1.3 million a year, really rich people. And they had this sentence that just shocked me. They said basically the typical rich American is the owner of a mid-sized regional firm, such as an auto dealership or beverage distributor. Mm. And I'm just like, whoa, like, what? why is that? I had, the same I had the same question you did. I'm like, right. I, to be honest, and people made fun of me because I have a PhD in economics. Yeah. I didn't know what a beverage distributor was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it turns out that beverage distributors and auto dealers uh, have some legal protection. They're kind of local monopolies, regulated monopolies that you can't just start, you can't just move to Colorado and start a beverage distribution company. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of Heineken and Corona and all the companies okay. have their own Mm -hmm. a beverage distributor and they're kind of locked in and then they can, you know, the beverage distributors can take a nice cut, uh, you know, going from the whole, whole, uh, whole uh, going from the companies to the actual stores and they have connections with everybody. Mm. So the lesson I took from that is getting rich is really, really hard because everybody wants to be rich basically. Mm -hmm. And you need something to kind of help you to give you a nudge to avoid ruthless competition. So, you know, in many industries, if you start a company, if you're a, you know, a, pest control company in you know New York City where, where we are right now and someone there's nothing to stop someone else from starting a new company and just undercutting you on price and taking away all your profits it's kind of capitalism is just a ruthless ferocious game mm -hmm. that a lot of rich people have some protection from that game mm. uh, that gives them an edge so then how would an ordinary individual uh, somebody listening to this podcast who wants to start a business find ideas of what could be productive businesses? Or conversely, what are some of the never get rich or rarely get rich businesses based on the data sets? Yeah, so a lot of things, basically anything that just has perfect competition where there's you're just selling a commodity uh, in whatever form, you're kind of very unlikely to get rich that way. Uh, so you need some sort of protection. Now, the protection doesn't have to be legal protection. Uh, brand protection is a big one. So one of the things that kind of surprised me in the data, you know, we know that there are uh, some celebrities that are rich that are making, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year, 20 million, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year these days sometimes, uh, you know, but I didn't realize that there are more celebrities than I thought making, you know, 400,000, 500,000, mm -hmm. 600,000, a million dollars a year. I kind of went into this research thinking, don't try to be, you know, a celebrity, an artist, a podcast host, a painter, a writer. <laughs> right. I'm just like, this is the stupidest thing you can ever do. Like, we all know those long shot dreams don't come true. 
And when you actually look at the data, like the odds are low, but they're not like that. They're not as low as I would have thought. It's more like a, you know, one in 20 bet than like a one in a thousand or one in a million bet that I might've thought it was. Right. So I think going all in, in a creative career isn't necessarily as risky. It, it, it gives you a shot of having that protection from competition, that brand, that those fans uh, that can allow you to make a good amount of money. To back this up a little bit, uh, the the premise of of this conversation is that we know from the data that the majority of millionaires in the United States are business owners. That is the number one way to become uh, a millionaire. But we also know, and this is one thing that really came out in some of the research that you've been able to collect, that there are certain businesses that do disproportionately make people rich. And so independent creatives, as you were uh, just discussing, uh, artists, writers, um, independent creatives are actually one of those, uh, what you call the big six of um, industries in which people can become, become wealthy and stay wealthy because of that brand protection. You also talk about, in addition to the independent creatives and auto dealerships, uh, real estate, investing, market research, and then middlemen such as beverage distributors. Why is there protection around market research, investing in real estate? How do those fit in? Well, market research, mm -hmm. you have the protection that you've kind of built an ec a very specialized expertise, hopefully over a long period of time. So you kind of, you know, you maybe collected some proprietary data. Uh, you have some connections, an amazing network you've built over years. And then you know something about a particular industry that nobody else knows. And you write these reports, you sell them to everybody for an exorbitant fee. And it's very, very hard for someone to just out of nowhere uh, build up this same knowledge base that you had created over such a long period of time. Uh, it's kind of like being an independent creative, but just mm -hmm. for more boring topics. I think. <laughs> <laughs> an intellectual entrepreneur. An intellectual entrepreneur, I would say. And then uh, real estate investing, you know, uh, I don't know if they fit in quite with the local monopoly sense but but i mean there are, there are complications investing has great tax write-offs real estate has great tax write-offs so that it's a little more complicated than that but i think uh investing in real estate there does some they tend to do tend to stay localized those markets mm -hmm. so a lot of like mm. the biggest industries are dominated by a few behemoths so social media for example right you know it's twitter it's uh, or X, sorry. Yeah, it's X and it's meta Facebook, now. now it's yeah. Meta. It's, you know, it's TikTok. There are a few giants and kind of, there there are really these niche mm -hmm. uh, companies, uh, but things like real estate investing, they're more disaggregated. There's not one investment firm or two investment firms that just dominate everything. You know, you can, you have specialists, you have, you know, all kinds of different strategies, all kinds of different expertise. And similarly with real estate, they're, they are, do tend to play to local markets in various ways. So I think that's, a, that's kind of another consideration is, uh, is it an industry that's just dominated by a few global behemoths or do you have a chance of building kind of a small specialty? I think, you know, I think a lot of times when we think of, you know, getting rich, we think of the really richest people, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, you know, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. Uh, but it's almost dangerous. It is dangerous to learn lessons from them because, you know, they're, uh, you know, one in you know, a billion, they're one in a billion outcomes. And yeah, it, to be a, to be the very, very top, you know, the top five on billionaire, you have to dominate a global industry. Right. Uh, but to be, and that's very, very unlikely, but to be kind of a millionaire, you want to have some sort of local industry that isn't dominated mm -hmm. by a global industry. So it's a, kind of a different game and a more realistic game to play. Right. And see that, that makes total sense to me because I, I remember from, uh, from investing in real estate, when we would see these big hedge funds come in and we'd see Wall Street come in and try to buy up uh, rental real estate in these neighborhoods in Atlanta, it was clear that they didn't understand the nuance of the neighborhoods. And so uh, local investors, boots on the ground investors and and their friends, you know, like you, either you yourself are a boots on the ground investor in Atlanta or you're, you know, you live in Indianapolis, but you've got a bunch of friends who are boots on the ground investors in, in Atlanta. It's it's that local one to one that where people had the the informational um, advantage. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there has to be some reason that uh, you know it's not just dominated by one big firm. And all these kind of fields that have a disproportionate number of millionaires have something that's keeping it uh, you know localized. Right.
Right. Now, one of the other, um, you know, myths that many people believe about entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs tend to be young. A lot of people, uh, when surveyed, say that 27 is what they imagine the average age of a, a startup founder to be. It's, it's actually 42. And there's a positive correlation between uh, advancing age and probability of success up until you reach about 60. Yeah, that's wild. Nobody thinks of a 60 year old entrepreneur, but they're really? crushing it. Yeah, uh, they're like the most successful out there. And don't trust you got is all about data, data, data. How can we use data to understand the world? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you look at the data. And it's kind of obvious. And yet also goes against what people think, which is really interesting, because I think one thing I kind of learned is that sometimes surprising stories just capture our attention are so exciting and so sexy that we think they're more common than we, they are. So mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg starts Facebook at the age of 19 and Aaron Sorkin writes a movie about him. Right. And The Social Network is one of the most popular movies of all time and everyone wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Well, the reason that movie was so popular, the reason Mark Zuckerberg's story stays in our mind is because it's so surprising that a 19 year old is running a media empire right. and it's actually incredibly rare and the exception and more common are the 50 year olds, the 60 year olds, the beverage distributors, the auto dealerships, the person who spent his much, you know, his or her career in an industry and launches a market research based on all their context and all the information they've learned over two decades, starts a market research firm at the age of 50. That's mm. common, but who's going to make a movie about that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's so boring yeah. uh, that we kind of forget. And, and then we make mistakes in our lives where we try to follow uh, the stories we see in movies, which are actually mm. unlikely. The reason they're made into movies is because they're so surprising. They're so off market. They're uh, so unlikely. Right. The man bites dog, right? Rather than the dog bites man, which is what makes the headlines. Exactly. So 19 year old starts company rather than 45 year old starts company. And then so many 19 year olds, you know, you see after uh, the social network came out, a large rise in uh, businesses started by teenagers and, you know, people <laughs> dropping out of college because Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college. And that's just mm. not a smart play. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a dangerous uh, thing in life is we're, we're so drawn to the, you know, great stories that capture our attention mm -hmm. and don't kind of step back and think about how likely they are. And I hope in reading this book, you know, anytime you're thinking of making a dramatic move based on a movie you saw, you can kind of look through the charts, you know, the, the mm. tables uh, on the actual data and say, well, how likely is this to work to work out? Right, right. But, you know, what's interesting to me is that there are there are certain businesses, you know, because it, it's easy to look at the data and say, hey, the data shows that the majority of millionaires uh, are business owners in, in the United States. And so if I pivot to entrepreneurship, that gives me the greatest chance of building sustainable wealth. But then. Uh, deep, deeper inside of that, there are certain businesses where you're just unlikely to have a lot of monetary success. So for example, and this surprised me, architecture and engineering services, there are high barriers to entry to becoming an architect or an engineer, which you would think would lower competition. Why? Uh, I think there's just like endless supply of people who want to be architects mm. uh, is is a big part of that. And it is hard to really stand out. Uh, you know, I think a lot of architects think there may be more independent creatives in that, you know, they are doing something, you know, using their creativity, mm -hmm. but it's not quite like an independent creative where you actually have fans and like a brand, uh, you know, it, except in very extreme circumstances, uh, right. you know, it's not, you know, there are, uh, you know, thousands of, uh, independent creatives, tens of thousands of independent creatives who have a small group of fans who know their names, who follow them on Twitter, who if they come into town are going to want to meet them or go to their show. Uh, that's not really true for architects. So it's hard to escape the right uh, the the ruthless competition of capitalism. Mm, right, right. Um, what about, you know, other industries like owning gas stations or personal care services like yeah. beauty salons? Yeah, well, the worst businesses by far except for independent creatives are things that are cool and mm -hmm. like that again movies are made of so uh, there's a study of which businesses go out of business the fastest mm -hmm. 
And the number one to fail, it was from, you know, five, 10 years ago. So it was when these still existed, but record stores was the worst. <laughs> Just there have been two or three movies about record stores and everyone watched this and like, that's the dream. I'm going to start a record store. Mm. And then, you know, then two, three years, you're done. And similarly, uh, toy stores, clothing stores, beauty stores, like they're just horrible, awful, disastrous businesses. There's basically no way to escape competition and everybody's trying to do it because it seems so fun. A game store, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't want to just crush everyone's dream, uh, but it, it is, it is dangerous to enter some of these fields that are really sexy, but then there are some things that are not sexy, but also it's hard to escape competition. You know, a uh, lawnmower business, you know, mowing people's lawns or, you know, pest uh, control, pest control, gas stations, gas stations, a gas station's a little complicated because I was, uh, the study uses tax data. Mm -hmm. And I think some of these businesses are, they're hiding a little bit of their, their money. Right. Uh, so I think gas stations may be a business where <laughs> they may be, they may, the tax data may just be missing how many millionaires there are in those businesses mm -hmm. from my understanding. Right. Uh, some of these uh, industries shield their tax money a little bit, but you know, gas station definitely is hard to escape competition. You know, they, I think of the town I grew up in, there was one gas station, he was killing it. You basically had a gas station right off the major exit of the highway where everyone had to go when they were coming back from work. And like, mm -hmm. and then somebody realized he was killing it and just put a gas station right next to him. <laughs> and oh. they just were in a price war the entire t time of my childhood. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of a classic gas station experience. Mm. Uh, it's very hard to escape competition. Right. I think just everybody in business just has to be thinking way more than they sometimes do about what's going to allow you to avoid uh, someone just coming in to your business and charging a lower price. So essentially what I'm hearing is you ask yourself, what is the moat, yeah. right? What is the economic moat that's around my business? And also how high are the barriers to entry? And also how desirable uh, is the business? How much cachet is there? So the optimal business would be low cachet, high moat, high barrier to entry. There's this phrase in business, uh, use your unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about, to, about this uh, before we started the actual recording of the podcast, that since you've been a child, people have been telling you you had a voice for <laughs> radio or podcasting before podcasting existed. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an unfair advantage that you have mm -hmm. uh, in this field that allows you to separate yourself. A lot of these businesses like auto dealerships or beer distributors, uh, your unfair advantage is that your dad or grandfather started the business when that was possible and you can just inherit it. So that's obviously mm -hmm. uh, a, a good way to get into one of these fields with a barrier to entry. But, uh, you know, yeah, I think, think, you know, market research, your unfair advantage is built, is the expertise that you built up over and, and the expertise and connections you built up over 10, 15, 20 years in the industry. So I wouldn't recommend people read the book and are like market research is a great industry. I'm going to become, I'm going to start selling my reports on, uh, yeah, you know, the real estate market or something, because, well, why, what do you know about the real estate market that mm -hmm. someone else doesn't know? Uh, just because it might be a good field doesn't mean you're prepared right now to enter that field. Right, right. Right. And, and that points to another kind of counterintuitive finding that the data bears out, which is that the best employees often make the best entrepreneurs, which is uh, kind of the social myth that we have about entrepreneurship is that it's the rebels, it's the iconoclasts, it's the people who never did well in school and maybe can't fit in at a regular job, that uh, rebel without a cause caricature. Yeah, there was a study of uh, the profits of various businesses uh, for using tax data compared mm -hmm. to their the wages that the entrepreneur had made as an employee. And you see that it's just like a curve going way up that, you know, when you get to the 98th, 99th percentile, 99.9th percentile of employee income, mm -hmm. uh, you're just way more likely to have a successful business, to have a lot of profit, uh, to succeed in, you know, however you measure it, uh, which does go against uh, this, you know, yeah, counter this idea that, yeah, you you know, oh, he's just an employee. He can't make it on his own as an entrepreneur. Or she can't make it on her own as an entrepreneur. In the data, you know, the best entrepreneurs tend to be, mm -hmm. have been the best employees in part because uh, they've learned uh, a lot of relevant information. You know, another uh, finding in the data is that uh, the best entrepreneurs, most successful entrepreneurs 
tend to start a firm in a very narrow field where they've mm-hmm. already had a lot of expertise, where they've been successful employees. So, you know, that's another idea that, oh, I'm just going to come out of nowhere and, you know, you know, and be the ultimate outsider and transform mm-hmm. a field because I'm going to see it from a different angle. And that sometimes happens, but it's rare uh, relative to someone who's been knee deep uh, in the weeds of that business for an extended period of time. That's right. And, and well, that goes back to another social myth that's often born of storytelling. So uh, the inventor of potpourri does not have any background in chemistry and yet was quite successful at inventing potpourri um, at, at first at noticing the need to mask fecal odor and then ha- at inventing a solution for it uh, and then scaling that and distributing it. Um, but that that outsider uh, you know, approach that the potpourri inventor took is uh, the anomaly. Yeah, I almost think like in deciding whether to try a business, whether it's a good idea. Uh, the potpourri woman I learned about in uh, the New Yorker. Mm-hmm. I think if you read about it in the New Yorker, it's a bad. <laughs> it's like the inverse New Yorker correlation. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad business. Like if, if it's in the New Yorker, don't try it. New Yorker articles aren't necessarily made about you know the. Yeah, the someone who's writing right. market research reports about real estate and making, you know, spent a decade in real estate firm and now built up some data and now is selling their reports right. and making $2 million a year. Exactly. That's so much more boring than the random woman who decided at a party that she was going to cure <laughs> uh, the odor of feces <laughs> yeah. with no training in this yeah. background. She, she crushed it. She made making a you know, hundreds of, she's made hundreds of millions of dollars, one of the wealthiest uh, women in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, So good for her, but you know, you only get one life. Right. And you kind of have to make your bets. Hopefully you make, take calculated risks and make, you know, smart bets. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, if it's kind of an amazing story, it's not usually not representative of the data. The data. Yeah. Mm, Right. Okay. So the, the inverse New Yorker index. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, not just New Yorker, you know, Today right. Show, uh, 60 Minutes, like anytime it's yeah, someone's kind of getting a lot of attention for what they did, because it's the reason that happened is because it's so surprising and, you know, surprising things frequently right. aren't representative. And then so many people just try it, you know, how many people read that story and then just said, oh, maybe I'll cure the odor from urine. <laughs> like, right. hey, like, like, you're just like, uh, you know, people are you read these stories and you think, well, that seems fun. That seems quirky. That seems interesting. Uh, and that's a dangerous way to make decisions. You know, the data also shows that when it comes to going back to our topic of independent artists, which we were talking about earlier, uh, or any type of independent creative, that there is a correlation between being prolific and being successful. It, to have great quality, you must produce great quantity. But also, it isn't sufficient to be prolific if only one localized area sees the result of your work, you actually need to travel quite far and wide to uh, have your work exposed to multiple markets. And that's sort of different. Uh, that, that's the opposite of what we were talking about with real estate, where you want to be hyper local. Uh, why is that? Yeah, well, with something like art, you know, the, uh, there's so much randomness in what catches on. You know, we like to think that the artists who are most famous are the greatest, but mm-hmm. there are all these studies that there's, you know, it's very hard for even experts to say that, you know, this painting was really better than that painting or, you know, what catches on, it has such a random component. You kind of need to do, you need to, uh, there's a phrase I love, increase your luck surface area. Mm-hmm. You need to basically increase the chances that your painting or song or podcast is selected among all the other ones that, you know, they're not the same, but they're just, you know, the, it's hard to say that yours is better than other people's. And uh, I think a mistake that a lot of artists make and a lot of people make, and this is probably true, you know, even in, yeah, it's a business, people make this mistake too, is just hoping the, you know, the world's going to find you. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's uh, kind of a- any way you can get more of your stuff out there in the world, whether put, putting a lot of it out there, traveling to, you know, much wider, being on more shows, being on in more galleries, uh, that just dramatically increases your chances of stumbling mm-hmm. on one of these big breaks that could make your career. And, you know, the thing about art and, and 
careers in general is once you're in, you're kind of, it's kind of a snowball rolling down a hill Mm -hmm. phenomenon. So, you know, before you're known, you got to just hustle like mad to get known and take any opportunity you have, whether, you know, it's in the other side of the country, other side of the world. And, you know, the study that I, that I really loved is a study of painters where they found that the biggest predictor of unknown, the success of unknown painters is how widely they travel Mm -hmm. to galleries, to showings. So there are some painters and it seems crazy that they try this, but they, they're not having success and they just show their work at the same gallery over and over again. Mm. It's like, it didn't work. You know, it hasn't worked yet. Mm -hmm. It's not going to ultimately work. And then there are other painters that are just constantly both accepting invitations and just hustling to get invitations. And they're going all around the world and they're not at the level where they're being invited to the Guggenheim or the Art Institute of Chicago or the, you know, the top museums, Mm -hmm. but they are, it doesn't matter. They're just, they're hustling. They're out and about in the world. You know, they're in Berlin today and Tokyo tomorrow and New York city, you know, the day after that, and maybe that's not even possible, but Uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And those ones tend to be the artists who then break in to the inner circle of made artists. Uh, who then uh, can go to all the top galleries and make a fortune from their art. So uh, it's a very important lesson. Uh, pretty much everybody I told, told this to are like, I need to show this to my friend because everyone has a friend who is just hoping to be found. Uh, you know, the, the artist mm. that's just, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and not allowing luck to work for them and just presenting the same thing the same way they've always done it and looking for their big break. And that's not the way to do it. Right, right. Increasing your luck surface area. But one thing that is notable within art is that sometimes fluke accidents can create the biggest uh, reputational bump. So the Mona Lisa, for example, was a relatively unknown painting until it was stolen. And the news of its theft uh, was the thing that propelled it into a position of fame. And it's now the most famous, arguably the most famous painting in the world. That's another reason that quantity is so mm-hmm. important mm-hmm. in art because there's such a random component in mm-hmm. what explodes, all, you know, yeah, the, the Mona Lisa, some random guy at the Louvre, he stole it. People thought Pablo Picasso had stolen the Mona Lisa. <laughs> People thought JP Morgan had stolen it. It was like mm-hmm. crazy. It was like the OJ Simpson trial <laughs> yeah. of that time. And then, you know, everyone's reading about this painting. Oh my God. There was a rumor that Picasso had stolen it because he wanted to destroy his rival's career. And they're like, wow, this painting's so good that mm. Picasso wanted to steal it. I'm not, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's just random basically that, that, you know, the Mona Lisa was the one that got stolen. But the key is if you produce a lot of art, you kind of have more of a chance for one <laughs> of them more, to get stolen. <laughs> yes. There's a higher. <laughs> or, I mean, that's the lesson I took. Yeah. Right? I mean, the other lesson you could take is like convince someone to steal your piece of art to get attention, but, which I think a lot of artists do too. N- not like that, but a, the equivalent of, uh, you know, fake mm. drama or getting in the news in some way to right. get more attention for their pieces of art. Banksy shredding his own painting at the auction yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. Right. What's interesting about what I'm hearing you say is that we often make the mistake of assuming that the stories we hear are representative of the truth, when in fact, those stories are the anomalies. They're the exceptions. And if we actually look at data, the data tells, uh, paints a completely different picture. But also, because of the fact that stories can create self-fulfilling prophecies, we can actually use storytelling to, as you talk about, create buzz around any product or any service, any entrepreneurial or creative venture. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so it's, stories are dangerous to make decisions based on, but they are useful for catapulting your career. Yeah. If you're an independent creative, Mm -hmm. you should use storytelling in building your independent creative career. And that was a challenge in writing this book because part of my point was that stories are not representative, but there's a reason these These stories stories keep coming out. out. And, you know, like I argued against, I'm a big fan of David Epstein. He wrote this book, Range. Oh yeah. He's he's been on this podcast. Yeah. And he, uh, he has a chapter in his book, The Outsider's Advantage, and he says, you know, you know, all these people come from outside a field and they look at things from a new angle. He, I don't think he uses the story of the poopery woman, but <laughs> uh, he uses, I forget which stories he used, but he's just like, look at these people who knew nothing about that field and then revolutionize the field. And people just eat that stuff up and 
the point of my in my I, point I want to make is that's actually not true. You know, look at the data. Someone is way more likely to revolutionize the field if they've been experts in that field mm -hmm. for a long time. But that's so much less exciting. So right. it's a little. It's just like it's a challenge that what gets hooked in our mind isn't necessarily the truth. It's the best story. And then, so we're all kind of a little bit misled about how the world works. And it's a challenge as a, a data scientist who's trying to be a nonfiction author as well. <laughs> yeah, well, right. how do I make, you know, the, the non-sexy data compelling to people so, you know, stay in their minds so that they can make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. How do you make the non-exciting exciting, exciting or something or compelling so that people, so that it sticks and people remember that? And right. they're not misled by uh, these amazing stories that they're hearing all the time that just the social network came out. There was a huge rise in people dropping out of college, starting businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's been uh, 15 years and that a lot of those people, their careers are ruined. Mm. <laughs> like they're they're trying to get back on their feet 15 years later from a decision they made because they saw a movie, uh, a, you know, that was completely mm. unrepresentative of how the world works. So it's very dangerous. Uh you know, our draw to uh, stories and, you know, e exciting, unrepresentative stories. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and you'd see that in in investing too. You you know, somebody gets rich off of crypto and you, you hear that story or somebody gets rich off of the uh, GameStop AMC meme stonk thing, right? You hear, you hear a few stories and all of a sudden the stories become really compelling. When it comes to actual investing itself, when it comes to monetary investing, oftentimes we hear these stories, these runaway stories of success, when the data shows that uh, passively managed index fund investing actually presents the best uh, shot at growing, you know, a multi-million dollar portfolio. It's a great example, but it's hard. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like I follow the data as well as anyone, but I invested a little bit in Bitcoin when it was at like 60K or something. It was just so hard because my entire, it was called Twitter back then, Twitter feed. <laughs> yeah. Just all these people like saying how much money they had made right. in Bitcoin and just hearing it from everywhere. And like the path to entrepreneurial success is basically mastering a field over 20 years. So you, you start as an employee in a very narrow field, you know, when you're 25, 26. And then when you're 42, 43, 44, 45, maybe even 60, you, the idea hits, it's your time. You have all the knowledge, you have all the connections and you boom, you're ready to launch your massive business in middle age. Mm. And that's hard because it's, it's kind of the equivalent of an index fund for your career in that it's the boring long-term strategy. Right. And it's not gonna be the most single most successful mm. so while you're going about this while you're you know still an employee at 34 35 36 some of your friends are gonna have hit it big you know they're gonna have started a company and they're gonna uh, have had a massive windfall a huge success and you know they're gonna have the bitcoin of entrepreneurship and you're gonna have to you know if you want to follow my strategy you're gonna have to put your head down say, I'm following the data, it doesn't matter. And in 10 years, you're going to get the payoff. Mm, right, right. And part of the reason that we struggle so much to follow the data and we are more drawn to story is due to cognitive biases that we hold. Can you talk about some of these cognitive biases? You, uh, I know you've highlighted duration neglect as well as the peak end experience. Uh, we'll start with duration neglect. Yeah, well, that's a study of like... Uh when we're trying to remember how painful something was, mm -hmm. we forget how, how long, long it, it lasted. lasted. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a big part of how painful it was. So, you know, we, we, yeah, we minimize, it was a study of colonoscopies of all things, mm -hmm. uh, back when those were really painful. And, uh, it turns out that, you, you know, Danny Kahneman won the Nobel prize in economics. He, he asked them during their colonoscopy, how painful it was. And then after the fact, he said, looking back on it, how painful it was. And it turns out people totally uh, neglected how long it took in their memory of it. So it's mm -hmm. really important to keep in mind uh, that's a huge factor in how painful or pleasurable right. uh, something is, how long it lasted. Right, right. And that, and that can be applied going back to what we were talking about with 
the index fund investing strategy of your career that can also be applied to our memory of what a particular job was like or our memory of a particular work experience you know yeah i think it's right i think it kind of goes against uh you know part of what i recommend is that people maybe grind out as an employee for a while but from your a happiness perspective uh, there are studies that show that people aren't quitting jobs enough mm. uh, that if people are indifferent if you're indifferent between quitting your job and not quitting your job if you quit it you're gonna be much happier in six months or uh, longer the data is sometimes conflicting so it's mm. good for making money may not be good for what makes you happy and it's not like there's one life strategy that is the right answer for all these questions uh, you know and, and I think people will kind of wrestle with the complexities of decision making and know that you know okay maybe uh, you know if I stick at this job for 10 15 years I'm more likely to be a successful entrepreneur later but also, if I don't like this job, the data says if I quit it, I'm more likely to be happy in six months or a year. And then you can make a decision based on that. Well, how important is the chance of being a successful entrepreneur in your life? How important is happiness? And go from there. But uh, the, the, the world's messy and data kind of frequently reflects that mm -hmm. uh, in that, you know, different goals. It's not different goals, just sometimes require different actions. Mm. So what should a person do? Let's say somebody who's listening to this. Uh, is trying to make a decision about some element of their life, whether it's their career or where they live, where they raise their kids, where they, uh, what kind of business they start. They're trying to make that decision. And so they start digging into the data, but they find conflicting studies. And also they find studies that in which the subjects, uh, the data set is, doesn't, it's kind of maybe somewhat comparable, but there are also notable differences between their own situation and, you know, what the study actually uh, looked at, right? What does a person do when they find essentially either conflicting data or slightly irrelevant data? I think you just have to be more comfortable with making decisions under uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that a decision is you know, a hundred percent chance of being the right decision. Right. It's more like it's a, you know, a 60, 40 decision or, you know, 70, 30 decision, 80, 20, if you're really lucky. Uh, and I think, you know, just what the data is, is supposed to do is just push you from like 50, 50 to 60, 40. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to have lower expectations of what the data is supposed to do. So if you're like, you know, the data, you know, I, it's not 100% of the data is moving this direction, but I've seen some data and it seems to suggest mm. that, you know, on balance, uh, you know, so let's say I'm thinking of starting a, re a record store. Right. You know, nobody starts a record store okay. anymore. A toy let's store. A toy store, sure. Thinking of starting a toy store. Uh, I, I, my friend started a toy store. It was a big success. Okay, well, I need to know that toy store is the third most likely to go out of business quickly. Or I think I think that was in the chart of maybe fourth, whatever it was. It was right near the top. Mm. Were one of the worst businesses you can have. The average toy store is out of business in three years. The average dentist biz, dentist business lasts twenty years. Mm. Three years or twenty years. Like this is very different, a very bad on average business. Right. That has to play into your decision making. That right. doesn't. Now you might have, let's say you know that you've just created a toy that is blowing up the world and. It's gone viral and, you know, Oprah just talked about your toy that and you, got, you have so much momentum where the, these rules don't apply to you. OK, fine. I, I, I would that that's OK. But, you know, just just know, you need to know no matter where you are, no matter what other factors you have in the equation, that this is on balance, terrible business. Mm. Just know that just, you know, and then make decision with that, you know, in your head. And uh, I think that's. That, that's kind of how I view all this, the data I present in the book, is not this ends the debate, but just something to know. You know, same, I have a whole section, we might get to this, on happiness mm -hmm. and, you know, what activities tend to make people happy. And, you know, on balance, it turns out that people, when they're watching TV, watching, watching Netflix, on social media, uh, playing computer games, are less happy than they think they're going to be. Mm -hmm. right. That's like a pattern in the data on right. average, significantly less happy. And when they're 
exercising, hang out with friends, out about in the world, at the museum, uh, at a show, they're way happier than they expect to be, mm -hmm. than, they, than they would have thought they'd be. Right. Now, that's right. very important to keep in mind as you're going through life. If a friend invites you, do you want to go to this Bruce Springsteen concert? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm tired. I want to lie in bed and watch TV. You need to keep in mind mm. that on average, people who stay and watch TV end up less happy than they think they're going to be. And people who go out to the show with their friends end up happier than they expect to be. That doesn't mean 100% of the time you have to go to the show. But if you're like close, you have to keep in mind that this bias that reveals itself in the data. Mm, right. Right. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Are, are there any uh, additional key points that you want the audience to remember? Uh, well, we didn't get yeah as much to happiness as I would have mm -hmm. liked to have gotten because uh, – you know, I, I have all this stuff on how to get rich and yeah. how to get famous. And then when you review the data on happiness, it really is shocking. The things that make people happy are so freaking simple. Mm. It's being with your friends, being with a romantic partner, being married, taking a walk, being near a beautiful body of water. These very simple, very affordable mm -hmm. things in life tend to make people happy. Uh, so I think, you know, there is a danger in you know, devoting your life to the accumulation of uh, resources or uh, accumulation of fame, accumulation of attention, uh, you kind of, it's, it's not necessarily the best bet for happiness. So I, you also need to keep in mind that all the research on the, the best strategies for being happy mm -hmm. and the day driven answer to life is be with your love on an 80 degree and sunny day, <laughs> overlooking a beautiful body of water, having sex. Like mm. that cap, that is all that's the happiest activity is intimacy, making love the happiest, you know, weather, 80 degrees and sunny, a uh, happiest location near a body of water, happiest person to be with a romantic partner that kind of sums up everything in the data we know about uh, happiness. So that's important to keep in mind as well as you're going through life. That is a lot easier to achieve than owning an auto dealership, owning a beverage distributor company, starting a market research company like that, those, that's hard being with someone you, you care about near a body, near a lake, uh, you know, hanging out or whatever is not as difficult to achieve. Mm. Nice. Well, thank you again for spending this time with us. Where can people find you if they'd like to hear more? Uh, I'm on X at Seth S underscore D. Uh -huh. I have a hyphenated name, Seth S D. And uh, Don't Trust Your Gut and Everybody Lies are my books. And I have another book coming out. They'll be called Who Makes the NBA? And it's about a passion of mine, uh, basketball. Excellent. And we will link to uh, all of that in the show notes as well. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks.